Hey y'all, what am I doing? Well, I'm fixing to tell ya. I am working on several projects at one time, which means I'm ambidextrous. I'm gonna put pumpkin away. You know about pumpkin? Pumpkin the junk pile arch top. Playlist right up there if it's done yet. I, I got so many projects going on. I can't hardly keep up with it. But let me tell you about this one. Da -da. Here we go. Let's do the reveal. You know what this is? Can you read? What does that say? It says, Guitar Kit World, even in Mississippi. That's right. I am putting a Guitar Kit World kit together. Let's unbox this thing so you can see. Ooh, uh, it is a single cutaway arch top body. So what does this look like? Well, beyond the fact that it looks like a guitar, let me get this box out of the way here. Uh, having some workman's compensation claim. This looks like a Gretsch 2160 body, and this looks like a Gretsch Falcon headstock. You've seen something like this before several times. I will give you a link to one of them right up there, but what I am going to do is I'm going to put all these pieces together. I've got two weeks to do it. This is going to go, after it's all mississippi up, so badly that Mississippi is going to covet it. I'm talking about all of Mississippi, everything that is Mississippi is going to covet it. And we're going to get the hands of an artist in North Mississippi that you all know and love. He's played all kinds of stuff, anything that I can put a neck and strings and pick up on. It's about time he had one of these. So I'm going to get to the bench. We're going to finish this. I'm going to give you little clips along the way. So don't be sitting in that armchair and getting all kinds of goodies and thinking this is going to go on for weeks and weeks. I'm going to give you rapid fire blips of the path to glory, brother. Just a minute. Don't go nowhere. Okay, take two. Acton. Acton's where I live. No, I mean action. This thing is going to be so mississippi up that Mississippi is going to cover it. We're going to put it in the hands of somebody that we all know and love has played everything else I built, ranging from a coffee can to a license plate to a cigar box to a rock with a stick and neck and everything on it. We're going to film this very slowly, but we're going to speed it up. You're going to get blips. So don't sit in that armchair. Don't get all thinking that this is going to be three weeks. This is going to come at you so fast. The pathway to glory is going to be short, brother. There. You know what? I think I'm going to go back and edit that one out and go back to the first one because they're both about ambidextrously lame. Let's go. Okay, guys. Let's get started here. First thing you want to do is put on some of these gloves and get your guitar in the prostate, prostrate, whatever, position like this. You're going to need a couple things here. You're going to need a reamer like this. You don't want to use a drill. You see these little fragments here? Hey, Chick Flick Teal Pointer, where are you? See those little fragments in there? You want to get rid of those by simply taking your reamer, like so, and working those over. Now, you're going to need some 400 grit paper. We're going to end up putting a piece here once we know where our bridge is going to be and sanding that bridge down to the contour of the body. Of course, you want to make sure that your 400 grit is not folded up. You're going to use wipe all rags, W-Y-P-A-L-L-80. They are made out of paper, 
And what's nice about them, as I've said before, you can go around and feel any roughness on this and it grabs up. You need to sand that more, but you're going to go over the whole thing, including the neck, and sand it where it needs to be. You want to make sure there's nothing in here, especially where this neck pocket is going to go. There's something you need to do before that. And that is you're going to use some naphtha, which you can't get in, in California anymore, so they sneak it in in lighter fluid. But you are going to take a wipe all rag before you sand it, and you're going to wipe off the whole guitar. And you're going to wear rubber gloves. And the reason for that is, I don't know where your hands have been, and they've been in the same place as mine have. Well, mine has been in better quality places than yours. I guarantee you. But anyway... You don't want any of that stuff on here. And if it's on here, like these little fingerprints that everybody puts on here, and you take your sandpaper, what are you going to do? You're going to sand it. You're not sanding that off. You're putting it in deeper. You really want to pay attention to things like Chick Flick Teal pointer going to the floor and trying to get away from the work. But right here around the edges of the binding... If you zoom in right there and see that there's little spots here with glue for the binding and some other stuff is crept on there given the finish we're going to give this thing all that is going to show up and you don't want that now i'm going to give you another example here something no one would think of this thing has a truss rod the covers on but you see that there so in the factory when they put the truss rod nut on there what are they going to do they're going to lubricate it and sometimes too much is not good enough, at least in the case of guitars. And you get this leakage here from the thing sitting in the case or in the, the packaging. And then it sits there forever. And next thing you know, because this is down a little bit, that stuff leaks out and gets all over. Then you try to put some finish on there. It doesn't work. So we are going to go along and we're going to take our naphtha replacement. We're going to put on the rag, the wipe all rag, and we're going to go over this stuff. And this stuff vaporizes off pretty quick. And you just keep doing this until you're relatively sure that anything that could leave a, a mark or anything on it is going to be gone. You see that's vaporizing off already. You can see it drying out right in front of your eyes. These wipe all rags are lintless, and that's important. So I'm going to wipe this whole thing down, pay attention to the spots we got. Then I'm going to come along and sand it, the whole thing. And then when I'm done sanding, I'm going to make sure that the wipe all rag doesn't pick up anything. I'm going to sand the top to the bridge I'm going to use. And then, and only then, Am I ready for finish again after I've touched up these holes here? You want to remember this kit has purfling here. I'm going to stain this so I don't want this to get messed up. Guys, never use acetone to clean your guitars. The ones that have um, um, binding and purfling because you'll melt that stuff and deform it. This one has white binding around the F hole and stuff. So pay attention to that. I'm going to give you a little clips of me doing this. It's not really that exciting unless your life is really boring, which, well, you're watching me, so I don't know what to say. Anyway, watch me now.
Okay, when you get the bat or the top and sides done, don't make the mistake of laying everything down on something that's full of dust and all that. Put a wipe all rag down and then keep rotating. You see there's a lot coming off of here and this hasn't been sanded yet. This is just the first coat. By the way, when you're using this stuff, don't spray it over a 10 by 10 foot surface because it is highly flammable, but pay attention, especially with the glue the binding is connected here. That's historically where I've had some problems and if you're using a really dark stain, like Oak Gall ink, that stuff is unforgiving. You're trying to sand something down after the fact and putting more coats on while everything is getting darker and darker except what you want. Just remember, especially where the arch comes up, right here where this concave is, that's where everything will collect. Just you can't put enough time into doing this. Shortcuts don't look good. Plus when you're doing this you can kind of feel along the way where the rag, the wipe all rag is binding up and keep the ventilation right because if you don't, you start talking kind of like I am right now and not making any sense and you all are saying, well, I don't see any difference from what you're usually saying. Okay, go sit down and just watch what I'm doing. Listen and learn. Neck is the exact same thing. Again, this is historically a spot for me because that lubricant that they use for the truss rod always ends up leaking out. You can see how it sits in the case like this. And if this is here, it will run down just as many times as it takes until it disappears. You can tell what's clean because the stuff vaporizes off of the clean area quicker than where the residue is because the residue actually holds on to the naphtha or the lighter fluid, whatever you're using. Don't use gasoline, please. You're making the prices go up when you do that. Alrighty then, there we go. We're gonna put this stuff again. Again, keep the gloves on. Don't clean all this and then handle it with your fingers again and then wonder what's happening. But one wipe off, and then we're going to get right to work with our 400 grit sandpaper everywhere. Um, sometimes these things are bookended where the grain is running this way or this way. Up here, you can see that the grain is running this way, so I'm going to sand it with the grain, again, paying attention down into the concave spots. When I get done with an area, I'm going to take a piece of wipe all 80 and go over it and see if it hangs anywhere. If it hangs, it needs more sanding. If not, then it's pretty good. Like right there, I can feel something right there. So I'm just going to take my 400 grit and go over that. And of course, it's where part of the concave switches. Can you see there? Anyway. Do the whole thing like this and make sure that the wipe all 80 doesn't hang up anywhere. And that should be good enough for the stain I'm going to use. Oh, I wanted to point something out on this particular kit. Some of these kits do not have this little piece here. Some of them do. It breaks off very easily. It's hit under the neck, but it's a stop for the neck pocket. Be careful with that, would you? Okay, when you get one part of the guitar done where everything is okay, go back to your solvent product, and wipe everything down again, get everything off of this, and let that solvent vaporize off. Keep these gloves on, keep everything clean, jelly bean.
Okay, we're off to the back. Again, we have a clean wipe all 80 underneath. And I want you to notice here that the grain on the back runs parallel to the body, not the way it did in the front. So we're going to sand that accordingly. All right, there we go. Good to go. It's moving along. I move the camera up a little bit more, but the mail was really good to me. The pickups came in. They're gold foils. Um, the artist loves these, and we've used these on other things. Now, when I last left you, we had just cleaned off the guitar, sanded it, and cleaned it. And we want to make sure that everybody uses protection, including Chick Flick Teal Pointer, who now can count to two or three or four. But you want to remember, you take your wipe all rag. Anytime that something touches this, you want to get it clean before we start. So I have... A bottle of oat gall ink or several that I made myself this stuff is very very dark let's get some light on the subject shall we there we go and um, it gets darker as you put it on now one of the things I discovered after I started putting these out is these look really goofy these guitars when they're jet black but you can look inside and you can see that they're bare wood inside, and then on top of that, I've told you that, isn't this goofy? That, trust me, right there, a middle finger will work good. Y'all are used to using that to have things. I say, anyway, there is white kerfing or, or binding right there that will stand out against us. But we are going to put this down. You don't want to spill this stuff. Trust me, you do not want to spill this stuff all over. Now, when it first goes on, it's going to appear to be a little bit light. But we are going to go inside the guitar and spread this around anywhere where you can see it. We're going to be careful not to drop it all over the top of the guitar, but you kind of get the idea. I'll show you when I'm done. All right, looking in from every possible hole there is here now, I can't see where the inside has not been touched with oat gall ink. Notice I didn't get anything on the top. So, just for precaution, we are going to take our... wipe all and we are going to give the top one last wipe down and let it vapor off before we start applying the oat gall ink. The stuff is very picky when you first put it on you'll think, oh, I just made the mistake of my life because it doesn't want to stick, it's light, but it turns progressively darker as you go, and you really, really want to make sure that it all gasses off and that one layer dries before you put the next one on. You start gooping this stuff on here, it's going to create for an uneven coating. You'll see me putting it on with a brush. You'll see me going with the grain. You'll see me 
staying away from the edge. Some people want to bind, uh, use, use uh, masking tape and all that. I don't. I just scrape it off later. It looks like a, um, a vintage touch anyway, but you want to make sure that your brush is flat and then you can come around and come this way. And then finally, when you're really close to being done, you use a wipe all rag, which is dustless and lintless to get the coat even. Put it on thin, you'll win. Smear it on thick, lose your... Okay, this stuff will not forgive you. So, you can see that everything on here is pretty okay. I'm going to start off at the edge, and I'm just going to pull it in like this. And you can see the pattern on the wood popping up, but don't be afraid to fold this as you need to as you go along. But that's kind of how you do it. You're going to be really careful up here towards where the binding is. If you start seeing any weirdness popping up early on, especially near the binding, and you didn't have a get that spotted glue out, you can have your violin maker's knife over there to scrape it off and then touch it with the naphtha and move along. Anyway, no sense in you watching me do this. Ooh, there's our friend a spider mite. Just remember, you'll be able to use a scraper. So when you get around these binding holes, just make a sweep as close as you can get in the edges. And then just turn your brush over and flatten it out. And creep it up to the edge. It's kind of like using a cotton torch once you get your setup going on. And then if you get a little bit of a problem there. Feel free to brush it off again. Most of this is going to scrape. But use this technique to lightly move along. Okay, when it comes to the sides, you've noticed that I've put on some masking tape because this binding, as you can see over here, is pretty thick and um, it's just going to be easy. I'll be doing some touch-up close to the binding, but this stuff, the cohesion and adhesion or whatever is, you can see that this stuff is trying to Play a few little games with the pores of the wood as it soaks in. So it's just a matter of keeping it not too thick where it slops all over the place. But we're going to set this in a little bit before we start flipping everything around. Because the last thing you want is streaks running down the side. It's just best to be careful and then follow up. To make sure your strokes here are even all the way across. You don't want any bands coming up later. The only bands you want are the bands that play 
your instrument. Pretty easy stuff. Okay, we're on the last pass of the first coat on the sides of the guitar. And everything is taken good. I'm pretty happy with the way things are looking as it. There's some pores that are taking some of the stuff. Remember, the pores, if there's stuff down in there, sanding them is just going to bury the stuff. So that first coat, getting the stuff clean before you sanded it was really, really important. And then getting this where it's not globbed up. So it's going to be pretty dark by tomorrow. Now we're going to make sure there's rags underneath and get some of this binding tape out of the way. But it will stand up. We'll do the bottom. That's what's nice about lintless rags and they don't fall apart. So top, bottom, and sides have a first coat on them. We're going to see what things look like in the morning and then do our second coat. Off to the neck. Okay, when it comes to the neck, I've left a little bit of this spot exposed right there because there's an awesome binding that goes all the way around the headstock that I want to preserve. Um, this fingerboard, we're going to darken it up a little bit too using oak gall ink. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that. A lot of this stuff is new. We want to make sure that we don't get anything on the knot. Um, and we're going to do something with the uh, front of the headstock. But it's the same thing here. We've prepped this. We've made sure that there's nothing going on here. The binding comes down here, the fret markers, and all of that. So we're just going to do the same thing we did with the rest of the body. Put a coat on it and be careful. All right, we are back. We got the body mostly done. Let's do a little bit of work on the headstock. 
and the neck. First you'll see that it turned out nice and dark and oh we have confidence Tammy has signed it already. Now I want you to notice that we are have cut out a paper template here. We're going to flip it over like so because we are going to actually stain this part of the uh, of the headstock here. We're going to cut out a piece of metal and notice that I have cut out a groove in the template for the truss rod port here. So um, the first thing we want to do is we're going to take our rag and we're going to take our naphtha or whatever product you want to use and we're going to give this headshot another shot because you want to remember down here all of that lubricant from the truss rod not leaked out there so we're going to let that gas off while we're doing the rest of this now I taped up the binding There we go. We want to make sure we don't lose that now. Um, and it's good to have this off while we're doing this next part anyway. But I want to show you. There is some good binding on this um, kit. And I told you a little bit about getting um, oat gall ink on the binding and just using your violin maker's knife. And you just you set a gauge. It's kind of like if you've ever cut metal with a cutting torch. You use your finger to set the depth of where you're working and then you just come along like this and get that off and you can, you see, easy money. Now we want to leave a little bit of it on there because that way it doesn't look like worms first day. But that's how you clean it up. Now we taped off, there's nice binding on the side of the fingerboard here, fretboard, whatever you want to call it. You see that? Ooh, ah, that turned out nice. But what I do not like about this is that this rosewood doesn't go real good with the dark color. So I've shown you this before in other episodes, so I'll show it to you again. We are going to take a piece of steel wool we're going to take a new piece of where's chick flick teal scissors when you need a new piece of or a fairly new piece of wipe all 80 rag and we're going to go down the fingerboard here like this and we're going to get everything off here we're going to do this a couple times because we're actually going to make this fingerboard just a tad darker. And what are we going to do? Well, we don't light, light ourselves on fire first. We're going to get all the grit and grime. And let's, um, let's practice what we preach here or there's going to be a problem. We're going to go all the way down and we're going to get in everywhere. Now, watch this. I'm going to take a piece of steel wool. This will work great, guys, if you just want to touch up frets or a fingerboard or something like that. You just take the steel wool. I can feel wax or something on here. But keep your eye on what it does to the frets. So we're just going to go along like this. Look at what it does to the frets. Can you see that? Now you want to remember that when you use steel wool, it's going to shed off little fibers. By the way, the grade of this is four zeros, zero, 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 or quadruple aught steel wool. It's very fine. Um, you really don't want to put grooves in your frets, but take your time doing this. And run over everything and you're gonna say oh yeah but that steel wool you rotated a little bit here and there that steel wool is going to leave all these fibers here and so one of the things you want in your toolbox and on your tool bench 
and close to you is one of these wicked luthier magnets. So you just go along like this and you will find that everything off that steel wool gets picked up right there. You see that? So now that we've done that, the steel wool even sticks to it. We'll put this over here. Now I have a very small brush here. You see this? It has a square cut to it or whatever you want to call it that. And we are going to actually freehand around these frets. I'm not going to matchbook this, but we're just going to come in and come along the frets and do that. Now, if your brush is a little bit stiff, put some lighter fluid on it. Okay, but the main thing is you get this where you can get that nice crisp edge like that. And you just come in here. You don't want too much on here. Try off on one of these. And you're just going to go along like so. Come right up to the fret like that. Flip it around and do this. Now, if you don't do the work with the steel wool ahead of time, you're going to hate life because the wax or the oil or the lemon oil or the Dunlop stuff that you use for these fingerboards is going to stop your oak gall ink from sinking in. Anyway, you get the idea. Now, when you get closer to a fret, you just want to use the shape of the brush to come in along like this. You see that? And you push down and you get the right pressure. You do this and then you just come along. And you saw us do this on the body. Flip around. There you go. I'm going to let this dry a little bit and then I'm going to show you the contrast while you're here on the side of the frets on the binding. Don't be afraid to go along with the corner of your rag and get anything that pops up there off while it's still a little bit damp. Okay, now while we are here, we're going to cover up this headstock with something, but I do, you see that, that form or that template is cut out a little ways back. So we know that the nut is right there. So again, we're going to take our brush and we're going to follow that purfling line there. Right along the edge because that looks really good against... This oak gall ink contrast. We don't need to get the oak gall ink everywhere on the headstock, but we're going to go ahead and do that. So use a little bit of care as you're walking along. Tilt the headstock down a little bit so if something runs, it runs away from all that purfling. So the difference between purfling and binding. This purfling, the channel for it isn't as deep. And it typically alternates and it sits back from the binding. But there we go. Okay, so now we've got the body out. And we're going to pull off this painter's tape that we had protecting the sides because the binding on the sides, if you remember right, was a lot thicker than what we have on the top. You see that there? So now what we're going to do on this is a combination between going ar around it, making sure 
that there's no spots that require us to come in with our with our small brush and and do a little bit of touch up here you might be tempted to do that with a magic marker but I wouldn't do that um, and then also you've got some spots where the binding has a little bit of bleed over so again violin makers knife get your edge just right don't use it like this use it like this and then just take your finger here and go along and set the width to the inner part right there and just drag that around like that you're putting a slight tilt on it until you can see all the lines the inner lines of that perf line I wanted to hang up there, but this is just slow and steady work of touch up and exposing what's there. And then I'm going to put the finish. Yeah, so now it's just a matter of going along. So now it's just a matter of going along and touching up an area that needs a little bit of work and taking your violin maker's knife edge side up. Don't go at it like this. You're gonna dig into everything. But you're just basically taking your finger again, setting how far you wanna go in, and then just holding that at an angle and scraping it until you see all of the segments of Perfling, you see that? This works really good. Okay, now do that everywhere. The sides, since they got taped up, there's going to be very little to do here. See that? A little bit right there, a little bleed through. But you don't need to get every little bit because we're not trying to make this look like a new guitar those of you that have been watching me for a while are starting to get it that perfection is not something we're after here we're interested in getting instruments in the hands of people that are actually going to play them and use them and not be afraid that they might get a little scratch on them that's our crowd alrighty then all right, we're finally to the back. This is really easy because the binding is very thin. And so it's pretty easy to work and get that little edge exposed. This white binding looks great against the Oak Gall ink. Once I get everything fixed up and dried the way I want. It's going to be time to line up the neck and glue that on. And I think this might be a good place to stop this episode. It's getting kind of long and we're going into something that involves a little bit more precision than what we've been doing, which is just basically slopping some element concoction of plant residue onto a perfectly nice guitar body. Ooh, look at that. Hey guys, I think that this is a great place to stop this episode because we're waiting for some touch-ups to dry. We're going to look for any blemishes or whatever. And then I got one more thing to do. I got one more thing to do, maybe two, before we glue the neck on. And, well, we're going to have to gauge our process along the way. Yeah, anybody that knows these kid art stops, they know what this kind of stuff is. Anyway, we're going to drill a hole in the body. Uh, that involves some precision work. And then we're going to glue the neck on. And that is... 
uh, something that on a kit guitar, that's where you blow it. In fact, I got a call uh, from somebody the other day that talked about they got a kit guitar, they glued the neck on and it was um, one of those calls that said, I'm glad that I listened to your channel and use hide glue because I can take it back off. So in putting the neck on, we are going to talk about what would happen if the neck angle wasn't right. So we're going to go through that slowly. I know you've seen this before on other episodes, but for those of you that haven't, we're going to do this for the benefit of you because it's basically putting a straight edge on the frets and lining the neck up once you figure out what bridge you're going to use and getting it sitting in the right spot where it's not way up over the bridge or down into the bridge. And that gives you the ability to adjust later. Now, I swear every time that I start building one of these kit guitars, the good thing about kit guitars is you don't have to worry about building overpass structures like I did the Galliano junk pile after the top collapsed. Remember that episode? But there's something significant about getting an old arch top and it never fails. I'm putting together a kit guitar and going, I am so glad that no one will ever have to worry about the neck if we get it set right, etc. And then I run across something where my alarm goes off and it's like, oh, wow. And this time I ran across something that is very cool. And I'll tell you what. Look at the neck angle on that one. Absolutely nothing to do. I picked this one up. You're going to see this one again. But this is one you can just walk right into. Do very little to. And uh, I mean, look at the tuners, look at everything, look at the headstock. So I want to close this episode out. You know how I like knowledge and history and all that. I have a question for you. It will be on the test, by the way. Kind of a profound question, but I am here to solve life's profound mysteries of the universe. So let me ask you this. How did we go? from, as humans, go from being Neanderthal Cro-Magnums to this. Yeah, this fine specimen. Yeah. Well, you might not believe the answer, but here's what it is. It's the archtop guitar. That's right. This is what made us jump from that to this. And, and you may ask yourself, what are you talking about? Well, there was a step along the way, uh, a big step, but you know that the arch top guitar started out with the infantilisms called the violin. You know that, right? And then the violin grew up and progressed to become the arch top guitar. And since then, Everything, especially music, has been influenced. All music, all music, classical, uh, early blues, rock and roll, hill country blues, rockabilly, just every kind of music, country music. And you're asking yourself, how could that happen? Well, it's right in the parts of the guitar. Even hip-hop music, hip-hop music, owes its whatever success to the evolution of man into this and then through the archtop guitar. You want proof of that? Really easy. You know the parts of the guitar, the archtop, you got the headstock, you got the neck, you got the F-holes, we're going to leave that for another day when you all grow up a little bit. But, but here it is right here. You know what this is called right here. This is called the waist. This is called the upper bout and the lower bout that make up the body. So what has this got to do with hip hop? It's real easy. Bout, 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 yippee, yo, yippee, yay, yippee, bout, bout, bout. Think about that one. <laughs> Sorry. 
read. Sorry, I had to do it. It just happens up here. I don't know. It's part of that progression from Neanderthal through this. That, that That's being channeled and you're watching it happen live. Somebody is watching out for you, partners. <laughs> I will see you next time. I'm not sorry at all. <laughs>